Good evening. Thank you all for coming. We right appreciate there. it. It will just be a second. Um, good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight to the mail forum. We have a lot of great partners that we appreciate that have come to help us all pull together for this event. And I'm going to introduce Blake Stevens, who is going to be our moderator for the evening. Yes. All right. Yeah, I'm Blake Stevens. I have the opportunity of moderating yet another uh, forum here. Uh, I guess this room makes up all of the undecided voters left in the city. So <laughs> how exciting that you all are here today. Um, our two candidates for mayor left in the race. You know them by now, India Kincannon and Eddie Bannis. Give our candidates a round of applause. Respond to this question with just a nod. Are you tired of all the forums yet? Bring them on. I love them. <laughs> well, we have a lot of questions. All right. Well, let's get started. I welcome you all to this forum on behalf of the following nonpartisan organizations the League of Women Voters of Knoxville, Knox County, Centro Hispano, the Knoxville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. The Knoxville Area Urban League Young Professionals, the Knoxville Branch of the NAACP, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Greater Knoxville Chapter, and the National Panhellenic Council. And of course, we want to thank the Knoxville News Sentinel for once again letting us borrow their house for this event. And our thanks to all the volunteers who made this possible. If I stand too close to the podium, I start squealing. All right, so I'm going to read the ground rules and procedures real quick, everybody. Uh, we'll start with display of campaign materials. In order to maintain a nonpartisan atmosphere, the uh, League of Women Voters board members have decided that no candidate or audience member uh, should display or wear campaign materials. That's like hats, pins, t-shirts, etc. until after this forum wraps up. Uh, members of the audience are encouraged to submit questions for consideration. Some of you already have. Uh, to be presented to the candidates for their responses. Throughout this forum, everyone should refrain from responding to the candidates uh, in any manner, whether that be applause, cheering, booing, or other. Candidates should focus on issues raised by each question, speak only during the time that uh, you're given, and avoid referring to your opponent. Uh, if I see that going on, I get a chance to be rude and give 30 seconds to the other person. Um, so. Um, Candidates have two minutes for their opening words, two minutes to respond to questions, and two minutes for closing remarks. Um, to decide who gets to go first tonight, I had a really uh, scientific way of determining that. I picked a number. I had uh, the candidates pick a number between one and 10. Uh, India Kim Cannon came closest to my number, so she'll, uh, she'll go first, but I'll make sure everybody gets a chance to, to answer first. All right. None of the candidates have received any of the questions uh, before tonight. Instead, the questions are being submitted by you in writing. Uh, during the forum, volunteers are moving up and down the aisles uh, with uh, note cards and pencils there to write down your questions. Raise your hand, and a volunteer will come and see you. Uh, before the questions are shared, they are screened by a committee to make sure they're relevant, uh, that they are not biased, and that they're not being repeated. All candidates will have an opportunity to respond to each question, and again, the responses should be confined to the issues raised. As moderator, I, again, get to be rude and interrupt if things aren't going um, according to guidelines and format. And after the forum, guys, the candidates uh, may have campaign materials. I'm not sure if you guys do, but um, that's allowed as long as they're placed on a table outside this room. All righty, let's get started. Ms. Ken Cannon, your opening words tonight. Thank you very much, Blake. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, my name is India Ken Cannon, and I know most of you in this room, it's great to be back here uh, for our second mayoral debate in this room. Thank you to all the sponsors. I won't try to list them all, but I appreciate all the work that you've done to make this possible. Um, I'm running for mayor because I'm excited about where Knoxville is and where we can be going. 
We're a growing city. We're a city where people want to live. And my job as your next mayor is to embrace that growth, but make sure that it's equitable, inclusive, and that we have economic opportunity for all, and also that we channel that growth in a healthy, sustainable way. So we have the uh, opportunities, but we don't turn into the next Nashville with all the congestion and so forth. I was on the school board for 10 years. I was chair for three of those years, helping oversee a $450 million budget with 8,000 employees. And I also developed a very thick skin during that process, which is important because as mayor, you need to be able to make decisions and understand and listen to everybody and understand that you can't please everybody. Just try to make the best decisions for the people of Knoxville. More recently, I've been working for Madeline Rojero. I enjoyed working for her from 2015 to 2018, and I only left that office so I could run to succeed her. I think she's got the city moving in a very positive tra trajectory and I plan to continue to build on her successes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Manis. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here tonight. This is, we are in the what I refer to as the forum frenzy, and Indy and I have discussed this. It's like lots of forums, but it's uh, a great way to get the message out. And uh, so we've been campaigning now for 14, 15, 16 months, and we're down to the final. And both of us can tell you how many days are left. And I think it's 28, is that right? That's right. So, and the thing that I'm most proud of during this campaign is even prior to the primary and then throughout the, uh, prior to the general, it's been a very civil and respectful uh, campaign process. And, and I'm very proud of that. And Indy and I, Indy and I talked about that last night. So, uh, but it is good to be here. I am Eddie Manis. I uh, am a native Knoxvillean. And I, I truly think that Knoxville is a pivotal point. Knoxville is a great city, lots of things we have going for us, but I think the direction of the city for the next four or eight years is going to be important uh, to the future of the city of Knoxville and, and nieces and nephews. I uh, am a native Knoxvillean, lived in Inskip, grew up in North Knoxville, as you probably heard at least 30 times if you've ever been uh, in a forum, but we'll have to repeat it. And I started a company called Prestige Cleaners uh, right out while I was trying to work my way through school in 1985. Started with three employees uh, in 1985, and today, company-wide, we have about 168 employees, uh, and we're a multi-million dollar company. Uh, <clears throat> so then I served for a short time, 2011 through 2013, as deputy to the mayor and chief operating officer for the city of Knoxville, and have founded a few non-for-profits, one of those being Honor Air Knoxville. So it's very good to be here, and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. We'll now start with our questions from the audience. Again, if you guys have a question, there are volunteers in the room. Just raise your hand. They will bring you a card and a pencil. All right, our first question for our candidates. What will you do to attract and retain diverse professionals in Knoxville? For example, Latinos and other potentially underrepresented professionals. We'll start with Mr. Manis. Sure, I think. Oh, sorry about that. Slide. I think it's going to be important to Knoxville <clears throat> for the future to really focus on economic development. And I uh, am certainly convinced that diversity is a big part of that. I think Knoxville is, a, is doing a good job with diversity, but we have a long way to go. And I, I think it starts with having an administration that represents the diversity that is in our community. And I've said many times that my, my administration will be representative of the diversity that's in our community. But also going out, recruiting companies that bring a diverse workforce to Knoxville and supporting the companies that we have here and giving opportunities. It's important that we really, within my Office of Economic uh, Development, there will be a department uh, or an office of uh, minority and women entrepreneurs. And it's not just, not just entrepreneurs doing business with the city of Knoxville, that's important. But I want to go a step uh, above that and really seek out minority entrepreneurs and women on entrepreneurs to, to really work and from an entrepreneurship standpoint, give them the tools that they need, whatever they need to excel from an entrepreneurship standpoint in this community. I want the city to really be a leader in that. And, and go out and actively in pursuit of those individuals and say, let us help you. Let us help you grow your business. Let us help you put, make, put you in contact with others that can offer services that you need. 
And I think that's one thing that's been lacking. I look at around town and some of the best and brightest in this community are minorities. And we really need to uh, help them excel and, and get to the next level as all of, you know, all of our entrepreneurs really need that to operate. Thank you. Ms. Kincannon, what will you do to attract and retain diverse professionals in Knoxville? That's an excellent question, and I want to focus on two things. First, when I worked for Mayor O'Hara, one of the things I helped her with was uh, making sure her board and commission appointments to organizations like KCDC, Metropolitan Planning Commission, KUB, reflected the demographics of the city as a whole. And so I was in the office and would, uh, we would get unsolicited applications from people who were interested in those very powerful decision-making roles all the time. But the unsolicited people who were volunteering their time, who knew about those opportunities, were not particularly diverse. So we made a special effort to make sure that we actively recruited uh, people from all parts of town, more women, more people of color. We would use connections that we had uh, through the NAACP, through 100 Black Women, through Central Hispano, uh, through friends and connections that Mayor O'Hara has to make sure that people knew these opportunities exist and make a more uh, affirmative effort to get a diverse group of people in decision-making roles. So in my administration, I will continue doing that and make sure that uh, both our, that we cultivate the talents, the many talents uh, of our diverse population that we have right here in Knoxville right now. Uh, during my 10 years on the school board, my own kids went, have been going to very diverse schools and I represented uh, schools like Fulton, Central, my kids are at West, um, Beaumont. These are incredibly diverse schools ethnically and socioeconomically and uh, I know firsthand of the amazing talent that the teachers have, the students have. There's amazing robotics programs and all kinds of talent. So I want to cultivate that talent, showcase it as mayor and make sure that people from all demographic groups are represented in decision-making roles. Empowerment is the key. All right, Ms. Kincannon, thank you. On to our next question from the audience. To what extent is it the city's responsibility to ensure that the health needs of indigent people are met? We'll start with you, Ms. Kincannon. A healthy Knoxville is a really big priority for me, and I want our city to be healthy. Access to health care is a huge, huge challenge in our city and, and in our state. I support the uh, expansion of Medicaid. Unfortunately, this is something that's beyond the control of the city mayor, but I certainly will encourage our uh, delegates in Nashville to continue to work on that. Um, I also will support the continuation of the city support of the many nonprofits that help provide health care, Interfaith Health Clinic, uh, the um, Cherokee Health is a great, you know, a huge partner to serving many people in the city. And the Knox County Health Department serves many people in the city. The, of course, the Knox County Health Department is a county function. And I want to just reiterate that every single person who lives in the city, every single resident, poor, rich, homeless, living in a mansion, we're all county residents too. We all pay our county taxes. We all contribute to the county coffers. And I will certainly want to work closely with Mayor Jacobs and the Knox County Health Department to make sure that we work together to support and offer access to health care through the Knox County Health Department in, you know, in a very collaborative way because I do believe in a healthier Knoxville. And as a city, I think we can provide greenways, we can provide walkability, we can make sure our streets are safe uh, so pedestrians and bikers and people who don't have access to uh, cars can cross and maneuver around our streets safely. Um, so, so the city can play a role through parks and rec and street safety and public safety through Knox County, Knoxville Fire Department and Knoxville Police Department. And I'd want to be a supportive partner um, with the health department. Mr. Manis? In a proactive way, I think greenways, parks, getting people outside really, uh, especially our, our, our youth, getting them outside away from the TVs and, and really working to show them what physical activity what that could do to, to their health is going to be vital. And I really want to put an extra effort in uh, focusing on youth, and especially the health of youth, uh, if, when, if, when my administration would go into office. So that will be a vital part of that. But also, Mayor Jacobs and I have had this specific conversation. And I really want to work to convene, whether it be Cherokee Health, the, the partners that, that India listed off, Interfaith Health Clinic, but really sit down and convene those 
those organizations that are trying to do this and focus on the health of our community, convene them together along with Knox County and the Knox County Health Department and say, this truly is a community-wide problem. It's not just a city problem and it's not just a county problem. Can we work together to come up with a solution that will work for county residents, city residents, all of our residents within Knoxville? And so that would be one of the first things I would do because I think taking care of the indigent that we have in this community is important, it is vital, and I will certainly put an extra effort on that in, during my administration. On to our next question here. It's a bit of a loaded question. In 2010, City Council passed an ordinance to protect public open space and parkland from being developed. First part of this question is would you support keeping that ordinance? The second part is so, how would you protect Caswell Park from being developed? Mr. Menace, that question will start with you. I certainly would uphold that. Uh, <coughs> the public open space being protected. I was in uh, Park Ridge last night and, and met with a few of the uh, people there and we talked about Caswell Park and I met with them three or four weeks ago and there's a lot of upset individuals about Caswell Park and rightly so. Uh, it's not about, it's certainly not about the supportive housing at Caswell Park, it's about that their park is being, portion of their park is being taken away. And that is a huge concern. There are not many parks within that area throughout East Knoxville. And now you're going to reduce the potential that Caswell Park will have. And so I, I would certainly look at other options. A lot of that depends on how far the Caswell Pike discussion and maybe and how that moves through city council as to what we would be able to do about that. but. If, if it is not underway and it's not been approved by city council, that will be one of the first things that I take on as well. Looking at Castle Park and saying, why do we have to take this parkland to really make supportive housing? Is there another opportunity and, and make to, really to make sure that we can preserve the parkland that we have in East Knoxville? Ms. Kincannon. Thank you. I support the public space ordinance. I think it should be applied equally in all parts of town. I also support and understand the huge need we have for more permanent supportive housing. I live really close to Park Ridge. I also live really close to Mendilla Manor and I see that uh, the permanent supportive housing at Flanagan Landing and Mendilla Manor is really well done and they're uh, oases of peace and stability for the formerly homeless people who are currently in those houses. So I've met uh, several times with people at Park Ridge and I definitely see that they support homeless, you know, trying to address the needs of homeless people. When I'm there, one of my things that I bring to the table is that I'm really good at problem solving and collaborating. And so I think that there's a way to provide more permanent supportive housing in a location that's just as convenient as the proposed one while also protecting our public open space. Uh, some possibilities are the positively living uh, property that is immediately adjacent to that green space. Um, I, I, it's my understanding that it's possible that they might sell it to VMC. It's already being used for similar purposes. And if they need more space, I know the architects have often built up, add a floor, add two floors. Uh, so you serve the homeless, protect the green space. Both are possible. We don't have to set them up against each other. All right, candidates, our next question, another big one. Do you believe that climate change is a problem? How will your administration address it? Ms. Kincannon, we start with you. I believe climate change is real. I believe it's an existential problem. I believe that we should think globally and act locally. I think that we also shouldn't panic. And one of the things that makes me extra um, optimistic is that Knoxville has the talents here with the University of Tennessee, Oak Ridge National Lab, um, TVA, KUB, community groups, conservation advocates, uh, working together to become a center for clean energy innovation. So when I'm mayor, one of the first things I'm going to do is convene and create the Mayor's Climate Council and get all the people with these many talents, the business community, neighborhood groups, NAACP, uh, I, there's a lot of people uh, who 
care about this issue, who recognize that it's a huge opportunity and threat. It's both. And not to act would be irresponsible. So I'm going to convene the Mayor's Climate Council, get all the people to the table, and start tackling these issues, making our buildings more efficient, making our transportation more efficient, um, pursuing making sure our options for renewables are also available to all parts of town in an equitable way, pursuing really easy stuff that just takes money and will, like weatherization of low-income communities throughout our city. These are all doable. We just need political will and leadership to get it done, and I'm the mayor who's going to make that happen. Mr. Mayors. I also believe that climate change is real, and I know that we have... Um, already a, uh, I guess a goal in place, I started to say a plan, I don't think there's a plan, but there's a goal in place to reduce carbon emissions and reduce our carbon footprint by 50%, I think, 50% uh, by 2030 and 80% 2050. And obviously it would be our, our role as mayor to, to implement the plan that would achieve those goals. And I would work every day to make sure that we are doing everything possible to, to leave not only Knoxville, but the state, the country, uh, a healthy, greener place than what we founded. And so there, I think there are lots of opportunities for that in, in the way we do economic development, uh, you know, and, and, and the industries, the jobs that we recruit into Knoxville. I think we have to really be intentional with those and make sure that everybody understands our commitment to having a greener Knoxville and really taking care of the assets that we have here. So uh, I will I will work with every opportunity uh, that I can find to make sure that we protect what we have. All right, candidates, our next question. It's another big one. How would your administration and tenure be different from that of Mayor Rohara? Mr. Manns. I don't know that that's such a big question. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we will have some similar goals and we will have different goals. I mean, it's uh, if you look at the organizational structure and because I was, you know, in the role that I was in, I actually worked to, to, with Mayor Rohero to put the org chart together early on uh, under her direction. And it's my org chart as I, the, the year and a half that I spent there, I, it has helped me understand maybe where the bottlenecks are in the organization and where the challenges are, and then listening to the community, uh, I think there's a way to work through that org chart. I think you will find that my org chart will look somewhat different than hers, uh, but that's just a new administration. I want to put fresh eyes on things, and that doesn't mean uh, clean house by any means, but I think it's a good thing to put fresh eyes on things when you have a new administration coming in, and people that are there to really support my vision and my vision that I work through with the community and the administration's goals. That's, it's really just like it is when you have a, a new, sometimes a new CEO coming in, they want their own team. And that's not unusual. And so I think that my administration will look somewhat different, but you know there will be some of the same departments that are currently there and possibly some of the same people that will stay as well. Well, I'm a little taller, and uh, I both, but there's a lot more in common with Mayor O'Hara than not. Uh, we both have planning degrees. We both care about equity. We are both women. We both uh, raised our families here in Knoxville and in the public schools and navigated those challenges. Uh, I worked for her from 2015 to 2018 and I've been a supporter of hers for a long time. I think she's done a great job leading this city. I think before her, Bill Haslam did a great job. And I think the key feature to both of their administrations that I want to continue is that they're collaborative, they're regional in focus. They don't care about getting the credit, they just care about what's best for the city of Knoxville. So I want to continue building on her successes. I want to support the urban wilderness. I want to continue um, you know, to make us a healthier, more equitable city. I think substantively, a, a, a changing emphasis will be my approach of expanding our revitalization beyond downtown, making sure that we offer uh, subsidies like tips and pilots to places not just downtown, but places in our opportunity zones in East Knoxville and South Knoxville. I'd also like to really focus on economic development and workforce development. 
Um, I'd, I'd like to have someone whose whole job is to be a talent cultivator and workforce development where we connect people to opportunities where they can train and get uh, better skills, particularly in the trades, in construction and welding, because then they can improve their skills and earn more income, and then that addresses a whole host of issues that uh, associate with poverty and affordable housing. So, uh, but by and large, I think Mayor Rojero has done an excellent job, and I will be building on her successes, not changing directions, but moving forward. All right, candidates. Well, you both have uh, chimed in on this issue previously, but of course now you have a chance to maybe uh, go a little further. Um, will you support the recent city council non-binding resolution to ban gun shows on city-owned property? Why or why not? It's contained. Yes, I support the resolution. I applaud Councilwoman Gwen McKenzie for putting it forth and for the council members who supported it. I'm with you. I'm a member of Moms Demand Action and I support common sense gun safety and this is common sense. We There are many ways to purchase guns legally in the city, in the state, in this country and we don't need to use city property to do it. I would agree. I certainly support the resolution. Uh, I support the Second Amendment, but I don't think that we should pit uh, city-owned property against private sector businesses and the uh, uh, Expo Center being one of those. The Expo Center is open for gun shows, and I've heard recently that the Expo Center and Chihuahua Park Jacobs Building were competing against each other. There's really no reason to do that. I don't think that uh, we should have gun shows on property that is paid for by taxpayers when there are other options. This, it just has never really made sense to me, and I would certainly support that resolution uh, that was put forward by Councilwoman McKenzie. All right, candidates, do you believe there are socioeconomic disparities between African Americans and Euro Americans in income, home ownership, health, and incarceration? If so, what is the city mayor's role fixing those disparities. Mr. Manis. Uh, my short answer is yes. And I think the city has a responsibility and recently I have been studying that specific topic. And the Office of Community Relations that is currently in place, the title of that office has never really made a lot of sense to me. And I have had a conversation with a, a few of the people within that office. And as I've looked around and really studied I think Philadelphia has a really good model for just that. And it's so that office will be totally redone uh, and it will be the Office of Empowerment and Opportunity. And it will be to literally focus on other parts of the community that are less fortunate, uh, maybe need better, you know, access to better education, better jobs. Uh, and really work, I think it's going to be important, and I've said this many times, to focus on economic development specifically in East Knoxville. I, as I look around, we have North Knoxville, South Knoxville, East Knoxville, and West Knoxville. I see East Knoxville as really being the development potential that we have left. I've used the example quite often about when Levi's left, and I had relatives that worked at Levi's. Levi's was a good paying uh, manufacturing facility at that point with good paying jobs. And since Levi's left Cherry Street, there's nothing that's taken that the place of that void. And we have to focus on putting jobs closer to where the individuals are that need those jobs. So I will have an intentional focus on economic development uh, from within and recruiting from outside. With that in mind, where in East Knoxville can we create jobs and really work with that community? to lift that community up and move forward. I absolutely believe that there are disparities uh, between African Americans and Euro Americans in Knoxville and across this country. Uh, unfortunately, our history as a country started uh, on the basis of you know, slavery, and slavery has had a long legacy even once it was illegal. Um, if you've had a chance to visit the museum in Montgomery, Alabama, it's called Slavery from Sla you know, Legacy Museum from Slavery to Mass Incarceration, and it tells the tale of uh, Jim Crow, of redlining, of uh, a whole series of the evolution of prejudice in our country. And uh, Knoxville is no exception. You know, if you had a chance to read or see the play about the Red Summer of 1919 uh, that happened 100 years ago, 
we've had our own issues and they persist. Urban renewal devastated the African American community. James, what now we have James White Parkway instead of a vibrant uh, African American community filled with thriving businesses, churches, and homes. Um, so when I'm mayor, it is the city's responsibility to always think about uh, <coughs> equity, to think about what's fair, and to think about who benefits. So when I am mayor, I will always ask the question in city investments, in public investments, and any subsidies we do, who benefits? Are we thinking about equity? Are we trying to resolve and offer opportunities to all people in all parts of town? Uh, East Knoxville, Lonsdale, Mechanicsville have had uh, generations of underinvestment, and I would like to correct that and remedy that uh, and empower the entrepreneurs who live in that community, who want to invest in that community, um, and there's ways to do that through the Opportunity Zone. There's ways to do that by uh, the city having projects that aren't so massive that only people from out of town can bid on them. So we break them up into smaller parcels so uh, new and less, less well-financed developers can have an opportunity to bid and succeed on those. So those are some of my ideas. Thank you. <laughs> All start. right, Candace. Well, let's keep talking about development and money, shall we? Uh, Cat, another audience question here. Cat has identified the lack of density along its routes as a major barrier to its sustainability. What will you do to address that problem, Ms. Kim Cannon? Well, I support RECO. I'm glad that uh, we're moving forward with a uh, revision and update of our zoning ordinance, which has been updated for over 50 years. Recode is meant to accommodate the, grow the growing city. More people want to live here. Uh, the market, the recode is not there to dictate where people live or what kinds of neighborhoods they live in. Uh, we, it's not the city or government's job to dictate people's preferences, but it is the city's job to channel that growth in ways that doesn't over, uh, overburden our infrastructure. So while people want to move here uh, and they want to live in walkable places, and they want to live close to downtown and the Tennessee Theater and the Bijou Theater and parks and trails and greenways. Uh, Recode uh, gives the property owners, particularly on the major arteries of our city, the freedom to build higher density on their own property. It doesn't require them to do so. So Recode could, uh, I think, will be a, a tool to add density along the corridors where CAT is already served. I also support uh, other uh, improvements to CAT. One of my first jobs as mayor will be to hire a permanent director of CAT. Right now there's just an interim. And I'm going to be looking for someone who can help us improve the service, who can help provide benches and shelters in every, uh, along every route so people can ride with dignity. And I want to thank my colleague and friend, Marshall Stair, for highlighting those issues. He's done a great job with that. Um, and I also want to um, move forward with my CAT for Kids program. This would mean CAT would be free for all kids up through the age of, uh, up through their, until they're done with high school. And this is an equity piece. It helps relieve people's uh, financial burden of buying tickets for their kids to ride the bus. It also improves, it develops that ridership habit among young people. And um, there's room on the buses. So why not let the kids ride? In 2012, CAT was one of the departments that reported to me as Chief Operating Officer. And, and we commissioned a study from MTAS to sit down with CAT, and it was about a three-month process, and just come up with ways that CAT could improve their service, be more efficient. I don't think that increasing density is going to happen overnight, so that, you know, it's going to be hard to really work on increasing density and to take care of the problem for CAT, or the challenge that CAT has. I would like to see CAT do a comprehensive review of what their current structure is, look at their current routes and say, how can we make our routes more efficient? We looked for quite some time at ridership. Do you have routes that where ridership is really low and some routes where ridership is really high? I also think it's important that it costs a lot of money to run our public transportation system. So that's why I'm a proponent of giving service where service is needed and knock it out of the park where service is needed. And then we have some routes where there's very little ridership that we're spending dollars on. So let's make, where, where the utilization is really high, let's make it as good as we can possibly make it. Bus shelters, you know, where there's, where, that there could even be opportunities there where you know when your bus is coming, 
They can even be heated in the winter. I've seen that in other cities. Uh, so I think there's a great opportunity to really enhance our public transportation system, but we can't do it if we just keep spreading routes and spreading routes and spreading routes, uh, and it just costs more and more money. So I really think that looking, doing, having a comprehensive review of where we are currently with CAT is going to be, in the near term, the best thing we can do, and then possibly look at increasing density in years out. All right, candidates, the last time we were uh, all in this room, uh, RICO Knoxville was not um, adopted. It was an idea, a heavily debated idea. Uh, well, now that it has passed on a second reading, uh, the map and the uh, ordinance itself, the text, a more pointed question. To what extent do you support recode the new zoning ordinance? What parts of the new zoning code and map seem promising? What parts worry you, Mr. Manis? So, quite some time ago, I uh, spoke out against recode, and it was more, I, I had a problem uh, with, I, I certainly agree that increasing density in the commercial corridors would be a great thing for us. If you look on Broadway, Kingston Pike, uh, Clinton Highway, Chapman Highway, there's a lot of opportunities to increase density. And if increasing density is really what it's about, then I saw that as the great potential to do that. And I made the recommendation as Recode was coming out that could we break it out into sections and approve it section by section because I think it would have a much better, a much better chance of being accepted and understood by the community if we did that. And the first section that I really wanted uh, to look at was the commercial in, in the commercial corridors and increasing density there. When that didn't happen and we started going over into residential neighborhoods and saying and, and maybe implying that the property values in residential neighborhoods could be impacted. And I'm not only saying negatively impacted, it could be positively or negatively impacted, but there's no way to really tell exactly what the impact is going to be to our single largest asset, and that's our home. And so I did come out and say, we need to slow down recode, we need to get that right, and really work on density in the commercial corridors and not impact, not impact the, the value of single family homes. That was my biggest concern. I've asked and I've, I've said, made a statement that if, uh, when I'm elected, that I will ask city council to delay that so that the new city council members and the new administration can get their arms around recode and totally understand what it is. Because we are going to have to be, the new administration would be the ones that would really have to defend it and really work through it moving forward. Ms. Kinfina, just to repeat the question a little bit, the lengthy question, what parts of the new zoning code and map seem promising? What parts were you, if any? Go ahead. I support RICO. I applaud the many people who contribute to revising it five times. It got better with every revision. I applaud the city council members who spent hours and hours uh, over countless meetings uh, reviewing it, studying it in great detail. I think delaying it would be a disservice to our democratic process, and I'm not going to delay it when I'm mayor. What I am going to do is implement it in a fair, open, transparent manner. I'm going to have someone on staff whose job it is to answer questions from the community, one person at a time. Anyone who has a question, whether wherever they live, if they're property owners or if they're renters, <coughs> if they're potential investors, they have questions. That's the city's job, is to answer their questions. And if they have concerns about the impact on their neighborhood, on their property, then we can take those concerns in and revise as needed. But delaying it will just uh, introduce more confusion. One job the mayor has is to communicate when there's change ha changes happening and to listen to the community and then make a decision and move forward even when it's not 100% popular with every single person. And that's why I think it's important that my public sector leadership experience gives me that ability to lead and communicate even when not everyone buys into a decision at the, on the front end. And so I'm going to go forward with Recode implemented in a fair, open, transparent manner, support the stakeholders' advisory group uh, as they review some of the more technical issues, and that's my plan. All right, candidates, our next question uh, reads from the audience here. Uh, Mayor Rojero created a Department of Urban Forestry 
This department tends to and grows our urban tree canopy on public land. Will you continue to support this department at least at its current level? Ms. Kinsella, yes. yes. Absolutely. As I said, I believe in climate change. I believe that uh, trees are part of the answer to our sustainable, greener, healthier Knoxville. It can reduce your few plant trees and have trees in your neighborhood. Your KUB bill can go down. Uh, it adds to the beauty and property value. I'm a property owner myself, and when you have trees in your neighborhood, your property values go up, your quality of life goes up. It's a good investment in our environment, in our property, in our city. I think uh, the urban forester, Casey Krause, has done a great job, and I would want to support continue to support that department, absolutely. This department was put in place when I was at the city and, and I supported it then, and I will continue to support it because I do believe that trees bring value to, uh, to the city in many, many ways, and I'm a lover of trees. I just left a home where we had trees that were 150 or 200 years old. I, I wish that Casey Krause could come up with a tree that doesn't drop its leaves uh, so, but that would be a, a totally different subject. But I am supportive of that and I'm supportive of continuing the city initiative on planting trees. I think one thing that I would try to do a little differently is maybe in planting trees, look at ways where when we plant them on city property, on city right of way, that we can make them where they, and the, the, the complaint I've heard is they get stuck right in the middle of grassy area, then it increases the maintenance cost for those areas and public service is suffering right now. So we need to look at ways to plant trees in areas where they will not be in the right of way of mowers and things like that. And that really in the long run will reduce uh, the taxpayer burden and will, will reduce the, uh, I guess, the, the stress on our budget. All right, candidates, our next question. How diverse is your campaign team? How would that diversity be reflected in your staff? Mayor, Mr. Manis. I, I said many times that my administration will be representative, and I, you know, you start kind of thinking how your rep how your uh, administration would look, and um, it, it has to be reflective of the community. We have several. I'm trying to think of the number within our campaign staff right now. Uh, I think we have six or seven on our staff, and of those six or seven, we have three African Americans. Uh, I'm trying to, if I start guessing, I'll try to get those numbers wrong. Uh, but I know we just opened an office in East Knoxville, and so I, I truly believe in the diversity of, and, and really a good representation of the community. That's important, and I can assure you that my administration will, would be representative of the entire community. Ms. Cannon. I plan to have a very diverse office when I'm in the mayor's office and the city staff as well. My campaign is very grassroots. We have a total of two paid staff. I've got one man, one woman. So I guess uh, on a gender basis, we're doing all right. Um, uh, our volunteer corps is really big and very diverse. We have people of all ages, ethnicities, uh, religious backgrounds. I'm really proud of that. I haven't taken a census of uh, every single person, but I do believe in the census, and the census 2020 will be among the first things that I do as mayor and make sure everybody's counted, because the, most, the people most likely to be undercounted in the census are uh, low-income children of color under the age of five. So. Uh, I want to make sure we count everybody in Census 2020. I want to make sure my staff, when I'm mayor, at leadership levels and throughout the city, represent um, the demographics of the city as a whole, and this includes our fire and police department too, because when we represent everybody, men, women, all races and ethnicities, we better serve our community. So that's my, that is my, I'm dedicated to that. All right, Ms. Kincannon, another question. How do you propose to increase public investment in the Burlington community of East Knoxville? The Burlington community uh, is a great example of a node, a little a downtown, a little node that's away from downtown that has a lot of potential to increase and grow. I see uh, it used to have, years ago, vibrant uh, commercial life, and um, there's some some commercial life that's coming back, 
So I've been there to some of the programs that the East Tennessee Community Design Center has set forth a vision in conjunction with the people of Burlington and the businesses, and I'd like to support that. I'd like to uh, expand along the Magnolia Avenue corridor and do, I'm, I'm going, uh, I think it's tomorrow or later this week to see some of the preliminary ideas set forth for improving Chilhawi Park. So if we continue to redevelop and have what I call responsible revitalization on the, of the Magnolia Avenue corridor, and by responsible I mean where we always uh, are asking who benefits and making sure that we approach things in a way where we revitalize while mitigating or avoiding displacement of the people who are currently living there, working there, running businesses there. So Burlington has a lot of potential. Uh, and I'd like to continue moving forward with the, the plans and vision, listening to the people and businesses in that community, and working with entities like the Design Center to uh, move forward. Mr. Manis, any plans for the Burlington community? Burlington, I, I remember Burlington as a little boy in Knoxville, and, and I think that recently, it's been a few weeks now, I was visiting there with Daisha Lundy, and I still get excited about Burlington every time I think about that community. There's a lot of potential. As I've said, there's a lot of potential in East Knoxville. I, I think it's really important to really grow the, uh, the East Knoxville area and make it vibrant. What's going on on the, the west side of Magnolia is great. Focusing on Burlington and Chilhawi Park, I chaired the zoo board uh, and just rolled off of that. And one of the things that we talked about, I, I talked about many times, was trying to make the zoo the partner for East Knoxville. So the zoo has half a million people right now, and, and we talked about getting those people to go out onto Magnolia and start to revitalize that side of Magnolia. So securing Magnolia on the west side and then working with Burlington and Chihuahua Park on the east side would be key, in my opinion, to get that all started on the right path. I also attended the, the uh, charrette, I guess, that East Tennessee Community Design Center put together, and I was so excited about what they were doing and so many of those great ideas could really be impactful for Burlington. Now some of those were really big ideas and really far out ideas which I enjoyed but I think it would be important with Burlington and that entire community to sit down and say what is it that you want Burlington to look like? It could be many different things. It could be as large and as grand as you want it to be or as small of a district and a very kind of artsy district or whatever the community wanted. So I think there's a lot of potential for Burlington and the uh, east side of Magnolia, and we really just need to work toward that. And I have a lot of excitement in putting those in motion. All right, our next audience question uh, reads, Knoxville's population includes a large number of aging baby boomers. Some of them are not financially well off. What measures are needed to deal with the problems of low income seniors? Uh, I just happen maybe to be one of those uh, aging baby boomers, uh, so I'll just go ahead and admit that. Uh, so I think that making Knoxville a city that is accessible, and even from a park and greenway standpoint, some of our parks and greenways, if you are if you're have any mobility issues at all, wheelchairs, walkers, they're hard to access. And, and I said maybe we need to look at the accessibility challenges within our parks and greenways and our public spaces before we go on through and start building other parks and other greenways. Let's make it so we are inclusive of anyone with mobility issues. I think that's important. I think it's also important when I look at areas around town, one of the things in North Knoxville and where I'm from in Inskip, Norwood, there is no senior center in North Knoxville in that area, Inskip, Inskip, Norwood, Fountain City, uh, West Haven, around through there. And I think it's important that we really look at community centers where they are needed, where there is a deficit with our current existing community centers. But I think it's that, you know, the community center and then making our city accessible for those of us who are getting older on a daily basis will be key. And that sidewalks, anything that we do from a public infrastructure standpoint, we have to say, how is this going to be beneficial to our aging population? Ms. Cannon. I support the concepts of aging in place, and Knoxville can be a city that leads in that regard. 
Uh, God willing, all of us will have the opportunity to live and age here in this city. We're, we, I'm not a senior citizen yet, but I hope to be one day, and I hope to be supportive of all the people in this community of all incomes and ages. Uh, some of the ideas I have for making our city a place where you can thrive as you age is uh, universal design. So whether you're two years old or 92 years old, you can access our parks, you can access and use our sidewalks and other public amenities. Uh, another big, big issue, particularly for low-income seniors and also people across the city, is affordable housing. Uh, if you own your house but you can't afford to maintain it, where are you going to go? When I'm mayor, I'm going to make affordable housing is the number one priority. I'm going to continue to uh, in increase the affordable housing trust fund and making sure that uh, whenever we uh, approve affordable housing projects, we try to make sure that there's accommodations and the types of apartments that have worked for families, but as well as senior citizens. So sometimes we need one bedroom, sometimes we need three bedrooms. So always make sure that uh, we have a diversity in types of housing we provide. The other idea I would like to consider is something Knox County has already implemented is a property tax freeze for low-income seniors, particularly if you're living in an area where we're trying to revitalize. That's good news. I'm, I want to fight blight and revitalize all parts of town. But as that happens, if your property values go up and your property taxes go up, that can be a really big burden on low-income seniors on fixed incomes. Um, Knox County has a program where that uh, low-income seniors can apply for a property tax increase. They have to demonstrate that they're eligible. Um, I think we could consider something similar for the city of Knoxville. All right, candidates, again, let's stay with uh, development and money. That's all right. Uh, in your administration, do you plan to put into the budget funds to continue the Magnolia Corridor, Ms. Cannon? Yes. You have two minutes. No. Okay, so yes or no yeah. question? Okay. Uh, I want to make Knoxville a place that people want to invest. I especially want to focus on trying to catalyze investment in parts of town that haven't seen investment in a long time, which includes the Magnolia Avenue corridor, it includes parts of other, uh, you know, parts of uh, Chapman Highway, parts of Mechanicsville and Lonsdale. Um, so I think opportunity zones are one element that we can work on. That's a, a place, uh, opportunity zones are a federal tax thing where you can get a tax write-off if you invest in property inside the zone. Uh, so what I wanna do is make sure people here in Knoxville, local developers in the community, have awareness of what opportunity zones are. And let's say you have to sort of be pretty rich to need a tax write-off. Uh, so we need to connect the people who need the tax write-off to the people who want to redevelop in these areas. So access to capital and connecting people who need the, those write-offs to the people who want to build and revitalize. That's something I want to work on. Um, the other thing is the Magnolia Avenue, t the streetscape, is that what you were talking about? They, they just the word, uh, continue the Magnolia Corridor. Uh, yes, I, I do. I have, I, as, I, as we mentioned before, I think there's a lot of things going on on the east side of downtown with a prospective uh, baseball stadium, with a prospective uh, improvements on the far side through the zoo and Chilhowee Park. So I think we need to make sure we connect all of those. And, and again, I'll go back to the, to the same question. Whenever we're talking about a public investment, be it a baseball stadium or improvements to Chilhowee Park, I want to make sure the benefits go first and foremost, not to visitors to Knoxville, not to the tourists, but to the people who live there, who want to use the park on an everyday basis, who want to start their businesses there. So that will be my plan and approach to redeveloping Magnolia Avenue Corridor. Mr. Mayors. I've said many times that Magnolia Avenue, the East Knoxville Magnolia Avenue Corridor is very important. And just going back to uh, Chihuahua Park, and that's one of the reasons why I put so much emphasis on what happens in Chihuahua Park. I think it's, we, it, we have almost realized in the city of Knoxville, we don't have a lot of critical opportunities or major opportunities, such as large parcels of land like Chihuahua Park, or uh, even though it's privately owned, East Town Mall. So I think as we work through these processes with these log, large parcels of land, we need to really think long and hard about the long term of that 10 years 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And so I am a huge proponent of what happens on the Magnolia Avenue corridor. And as I said earlier, what happens in Burlington, what happens in Chilhowee Park, 
will drive, I think, the Magnolia Avenue corridor a lot. I think it's really important. Also, I visited with a lady who called me and said, can you come and look and see what has happened outside my business? And, and she was on a little street right off of Magnolia and they had really done something weird and I couldn't really understand. But I said, you just need to call Don Michelle Foster and just have her come out here and look at this and see what they can do. And so Don Michelle Foster went out there. The city changed it. I think it's important as we go through this process with the Magnolia Avenue corridor, corridor we have to remember there are existing businesses already on Magnolia Avenue. So it's important we don't destroy those existing businesses on the way to really trying to stimulate more growth there. I think we do have to be very intentional about taking that into mind and really thinking about what does this curb that we're putting here or what does this delay, what does this do to the existing businesses we have because we don't want to destroy them when we're all in the middle of trying to get to stimulate the economy there in East Knoxville on, on, on Magnolia. All right, candidates, our next, uh, you, you guys already touched on this a bit, and we uh, had the cat question. Uh, but just in general, what do you view the city's mayor's role to be in supporting public transportation? Mr. Manis. I think we did hit on that, but I think it's important that <clears throat> we are the champion and ambassador for public transportation. And because it does serve a large percentage of our population, and when you think about you have, if you don't have a car, which a lot of people in our, our city just do not have a car, what is your way to get from point A to point B, to the grocery store, to the bank, wherever you need to go? And so I take that very seriously. Uh, and it would be easy to lose sight if for so many of us that have cars, but <clears throat> I have friends who do not have cars. And so I understand the value of public transportation. And like I said earlier, I would do everything that within my, uh, the power of my administration to make sure that we enhance public transportation where it is needed most and make it as efficient as we possibly could. I think the, oops, is this still? No. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, the mayor, my job as mayor is, uh, myriad, I have myriad responsibilities including being a champion for public transit, but also a champion for multimodal transportation. Uh, a lot of us get around by car. Some people want to or have to walk. Some people are in wheelchairs. Some people uh, prefer to bike. Uh, when I'm mayor, I'm going to be aware of accessibility, aware of affordability, aware of equity, and making sure that people can get around town in safe, affordable ways uh, wherever you try to go, and, and CAP is certainly a big part of that. Um, we have some room for improvement in that, and, and like I said, my one of my big new hires, my first one of my first priorities to hire is a new CAP director who's going to have the vision and skills and experience to improve our public transit system. But I want to do this in conjunction with making sense for other modes of transit too, uh, including cars and bikes and walking. All right. I I apologize if you um, if you guys are tired of bouncing around. We're going to go back to guns, if that's all right. This question reads, research has shown that city gun violence can be reduced through community greening and cleaning programs, which includes uh, cleaning uh, vacant lots, improving street lighting, developing community gardens, etc. Would you develop and support such programs uh, based around crime prevention, or what specific steps would you take, Ms. Kim Cannon? I, I absolutely would. I think that there's a lot of ways to tackle uh, gun violence and crime. And the theory that you're talking about is sort of like the broken windows theory. If you have an abandoned building and, and the windows get broken and you just let it fester, uh, it, sets, it sends a signal to the community that nobody cares about this, that the standards and expectations for safety and behavior are low. But if you take care of the buildings, if you fix the broken windows, if you repair the blighted properties, if you take an empty lot and turn it from uh, a place that's uh, scary and filled with litter to a place with a community garden, crime will go down. And I want to empower neighborhoods to take care of those problems internally. The police are important, and they are important parts of our law enforcement strategy. 
But also important is the people out in the neighborhoods, whether they're ministers or the grandma who's looking out her window and saying, stop that, pick up your trash. You know, just those, uh, this level of acceptance of social order or disorder, that's what can really make a neighborhood feel safe or not. So I want to empower neighborhoods. And that's where my background is, is in strengthening neighborhoods and schools. And I think that is a huge step in the right direction to uh, making neighborhoods feel safer, to uh, curtailing gun violence and other kinds of crime. And I would want to fully empower our neighborhoods to work on those things. I agree that blighted properties, uh, abandoned houses. I, I was with a lady over uh, in Mechanicsville on Brandall Street, and there was a. She tried really hard to keep her lot and her property pristine, and, and she had planted flowers and everything. And she said, "Eddie, I want you to come here, and I want to show you what is next door to me." And next door to her was a beautiful Victorian house with the weeds grown up halfway up the windows. And she said, "Let's walk over there." And as we walked over there there was a rat that ran out of the, the grass and into her yard and she said, what incentive do I have to really keep my yard nice when, you're, when you have this right next door to you? And that is key, I think, I totally agree that we need to work with codes enforcement to get blighted properties. This week alone, this is Tuesday, I've seen three pictures of lots that were so piled up with junk and wood and tires and trash and it's some, one I saw yesterday was just nothing but trash. And so I think it's important if we can keep those areas clean, then I think it does give everyone in that community a sense of pride and a sense of ownership that is lacking in some of our communities. And I think that is key. Taking ownership of your community and instilling a sense of pride will be important moving forward. So I think it's, and even with abandoned houses, I've looked at some abandoned houses out on Linden Avenue and there's uh, visiting with a lady and there was three houses right around her that were abandoned and they were boarded up and she said that there were people going in and out of those houses what are they doing in those houses well I think for the most part we all know that maybe some bad things are going on in those houses so I really want to work, work with codes enforcement to get on those let's get those cleaned up and I think there's an opportunity under my administration for codes enforcement to really report more up into KPD. In some cities, that's where that works because they do work hand in hand. So I think you'll find that important. All right, next question. A lot of people are concerned about policies and practices that support gentrification. What do you plan to do to address these concerns, Mr. Manis? Everywhere we go, we hear gentrification. And it is a serious issue and I don't think that blight is the answer to not have gentrification. I think there's a way uh, that we can be intentional with the uh, redevelopment, with our redevelopment practices when we go into a community and think about we do not want to displace the people that are currently here. And so it's being intentional about going in making, uh, making improvements and making sure that we keep those individuals that are currently there, it really really becomes more of an impact when you have renters, because as we improve the properties in the area or as the properties increase in value, then you have everybody's property value that starts to go up. I think there are ways at that point we can, we can do lots of things. One of the things is freeze property taxes, and we can freeze property taxes for as long as an individual owns the house, and then if it changes, then that could be uh, redone and then the property taxes would go up to the current rates. But I, I would be intentional about looking for ways to impact, to, to, I guess, have as little impact from a gentrification standpoint as we possibly could as redevelopment starts into a community. My plan, that's okay. <laughs> My approach to avoiding gentrification is I call it responsible revitalization. I support revitalization of parts of town that haven't had investment in a long time or haven't had enough investment, but we can do so in a responsible way that avoids displacement and gentrification. Some of my ideas are, as I mentioned before, a property tax freeze for low-income seniors. Uh, also, incentives for landlords to fix up their properties but maintain the same rent. 
you know, we have a facade improvement grant, maybe there can be through the community development department programs and incentives for landlords to repair and maintain and weatherize their properties uh, with city subsidies, but but the, the string attached to it is that you wouldn't be allowed to raise the rent for X number of years. And I don't know exactly what that would look like, but that's worked well in other cities. Uh, the other thing is to uh, make sure that we empower people to revitalize their own properties and invest in those opportunity zones. But if there's a public element involved, we can have carrots so they include affordable housing and then particularly incentives for what's called the missing middle. Uh, we have huge uh, multifamily dwellings with 100 or more units, uh, either public housing or private developers, and those work well in some cases, and then we have a lot of single family housing. What's missing is the what, what uh, housing advocates, advocates call as the missing middle. Duplexes, triplexes, uh, units with 10, you know, 10 units. So I would like to incentivize those because that's affordable, and what, we, what benefits the community and what prevents um, gentrification is having a diversity of housing. Uh, so different people with different income levels at different stages of their life can all live in the same neighborhood. All right, Candace, we are down to two final questions. Uh, one of these questions, are, one, one question reads, will you suspend the departments and uh, deferments rather and other subsidies for downtown and focus on urban renewal neighborhoods, Ms. Kincaid. I would not promise to suspend. I, I think you need to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, but my guiding principle would be to use public subsidies, TIFs, pilots in areas outside of downtown. I think downtown is going really well, uh, but I don't want to like say a hard and fast rule that I would never consider a subsidy for a downtown property. Maybe there's one that would, would warrant that attention, I, uh, but my guiding principle would be to try to put those subsidies in places that need more investment and downtown is already thriving. I don't think I would, I would certainly agree with India. I would never say that I would defer all of those from downtown, but it's obvious that our downtown is, is really doing well. Uh, all you have to do is just look around and see the growth that's going on downtown. What I would say is that I want to put the same emphasis and the same attention to East Knoxville and some other areas, but specifically East Knoxville all the way out through the Magnolia Corridor. I want to put the same focus that we put on Market Square and the downtown revitalization into the East Knoxville and the Magnolia Corridor. I think that's when things start to change. If you really look at the passion that was behind downtown and that whole revitalization, uh, that's the momentum we're going to have to have to tackle any big major project in this city. Uh, I, I think that's Magnolia, East Knoxville. I think about that from an economic development standpoint, uh, from an entrepreneurship standpoint, from a minority entrepreneurship standpoint. And so I think there's opportunities, maybe, I can't think of one, but for TIFs and pilots, maybe downtown, but I certainly would have that same effort going out throughout Magnolia and East Knoxville uh, and also be able to look at more facade grants going through that community. All right, candidates, last question for you. Uh, this is another one that we have sort of touched on, but another direct uh, question here on the subject. What is your intent in the support of and work toward economic development and increased employment in the inner city and especially within the African American community? Mr. Mims. I think I've answered that one other time, but uh, Throughout the Office of Economic Development, I've said this, that, that there will be an intentional focus with, to the point where there will be a department within that that will do nothing but focus on minority entrepreneurship and female entrepreneurs. That will be their focus. They will, they will aggressively and proactively go out and find entrepreneurs that are really struggling maybe to figure out balance sheet, financial statements, uh, payroll, all of those things, and link them to the tools to make them successful. We call that growing our own. And then going out really looking for companies to come in 
one of the first things that I would want to do, and I used, I used uh, Levi's as an example, that property is still available. If you look on Cherry Street, there's a lot of property right through there that could be available. I don't, I don't uh, claim to know the, the ownership of that property structure, but I do think that you have those, those warehouses, those big parcels of property there that would be very good parcels for companies to relocate on. And I think in the city, and in East Knoxville, but across the city, we need jobs of all levels, not just not just high paying jobs. I think there's a, an opportunity for high paying jobs, but we also need people, we, we need companies that will employ the workforce that's representative in our community. And I want to make the whole East Knoxville economic development area and Mechanicsville and Lonsdale uh, a place where whatever level you are, you can go seek employment and it's convenient to you. It's right in your neighborhood. You don't have to take a bus from East Knoxville all the way to Fairgate, or you know that's one of the things they were talking about, but all the, way, all the way across town. You can get a job in your neighborhood and not travel far away from where you live. Will you just restate the question? Sure thing. Actually, I gave my question oh. away really <laughs> okay. quickly. Got it. Here we go. What is your intent and the support of and work toward economic development and increased employment in the inner city and especially within the African American community? Okay. Thank you. We can spend a lot of our time and energy thinking about buildings and streetscapes and infrastructure, and that is an important part of the role of the city. But the most important asset in the city of Knoxville is the people. So when I'm mayor, I'm going to invest in the people of Knoxville. I'm an educator, and uh, I've been a teacher. I was on the school board for 10 years. And to me, it's not the city's job to start businesses or to make one business succeed and not another, but to invest and let people build their own businesses and build their own talents and build their own potential. So I'm going to be a supportive partner to making every people, every, making our school strong from birth to K, from K to 12, and post college and post-secondary. I'm going to have someone who's a workforce development coordinator to connect families to opportunities in workforce training from welding to high-skilled nursing to carpentry and plumbing where people can improve their skills and earn more income because if the people of Knoxville have the opportunities, they'll make their own entrepreneurial ideas come, come to bear. And that's what I want to do as mayor. Candidates and I apologize. I lied a moment ago. The, the uh, board of our what is it? Uh, screeners is that right? Screeners committee. Okay, gotta think about it for a second. Anyway, sorry for the fake news. Here's your last question: <laughs> <laughs> Is the revitalization of Knoxville College necessary for revival of inner city economic development of the city and education of its citizens? I did this when I was with KICMA uh, a couple weeks ago. Raise your hand if you've attended an HBCU, a historically black college or university. A lot of people here have had access to these great resources. Sometimes it's Knoxville College, sometimes it's a college or HBCU outside of Knoxville. They've been an incredible resource to the African American community when they weren't allowed to go to white schools. Uh, Knoxville College has a great tradition. I'm meeting with the board members of the Knoxville College next week, and I want to talk to them about what they think are the best plans moving forward. It's a huge property. It has been a jewel in the city uh, over the years, an educational jewel, an architectural jewel. It has a lot of tradition. Um, I'm not sure what the best way forward is. It could, it's not a jewel right now. It's fallen apart. There are parts of it that have been restored. There, I know it's been re-accredited, and uh, we had a graduate this year, so that's fantastic news. I'm not sure what the long-term plans are, but I, as mayor, would love to be a partner with the people who own the property and the people who are part of the Knoxville College community and work together to find uh, what works best for the community. I will also be, I have a meeting next week uh, during the, the Knoxville College homecoming. Uh, with the board of directors, uh, Alvin Nance, and I will be meeting with them. And, and again, I told the story about the lady on Brandall Street. 
we did a little drive by and we drove around Knoxville College and I look at these buildings on the Knoxville College campus and I'm like, these buildings still look like the bones are very strong to me and they're there just waiting to be redeveloped, someone to come in and give them loving care. Obviously, I haven't been in the buildings, but they look really, I mean, they're brick buildings, so I'm not sure what all could be happening to those uh, on the inside, but outside they look great. I would, my conversation with Knoxville College, whoever the audience is with, would say, as your mayor, I will do everything possible to bring back Knoxville College to the extent that you want the city to play the role and to the extent that you want Knoxville College to be. I don't claim to know what Knoxville College should be. I just know that it has the ability to be a jewel on that hill. And every time I drive by it, I get a little heart sick because I'm just afraid that it continues to decline. And I don't know exactly what might go on in those buildings. And I don't think that we should lose one more building on Knoxville College campus to fire. And I think it's time that we really come together and work together and say, what can we do from the Knoxville College Board, from that community, and from the city? How can we really reestablish Knoxville College as the gym that it once was? All right, before we get to our candidates' uh, closing remarks, I just looked, and we are 28 days exactly from Election Day, 28 days away. One of these two will be our mayor-elect. So let's give the candidates a round of applause for being here. <laughs> Answering all of our questions. Mr. Manis, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, being here and for staying throughout the, the process. Uh, it is 28 days. We've been working now. I think my campaign has been working for about 14 or 15 months. And we have, we have a lot of challenges. We've all talked, even before the primary, but going through affordable housing, homelessness, economic development, uh, so many opportunities, education, the educational experience of our city kids, how important all of these things are. And I, I truly think that my experience really drives economic development and job growth. I, I, I say quite often, without economic development and job growth, nothing else really happens. It takes money and you have to have a tax base and you have to create jobs. It's been almost 20 years, I think, the last time I looked since we had a new company relocate to Knoxville from outside the area. It is, we can't continue that. It's not been that long since we've had a company to leave Knoxville and we have companies leaving and not many coming in. So I, I certainly know the pain of what it's like to, to start a business, own a business and, and navigate the tough times and then I know from the city of Knoxville's perspective, as chief operating officer, uh, the inner workings of city government. And I think those two going together uh, will really lend itself very good to, with my experience uh, to manage during the good times and manage during the bad times. I mean, I directly hired people, I've directly put together budgets, and I think it's gonna be important that we talk, we've talked about a lot of you know, managing expenses here, but it's gonna be important that we look for ways to come up with new revenue streams so the brunt of the responsibility does not have to be on the back of the property taxpayer. And we do have some opportunities to increase revenue, and I know some of those, and I would certainly like to have the opportunity to do that, and I hope that you will consider me as your next mayor. Thank you. My name is India Kincannon. I've dedicated my life to public service. I've always also played sports, and I believe you practice how you play. During this campaign, we've been grassroots. We're all about promoting neighborhoods and people. I've raised my kids here in Knoxville. They've gone to Beaumont Elementary at the in a very a Title I school at the foot of Western Heights. They've gone to Bearden Middle and West High, some of our most diverse and great schools. We have great schools across the city. And the number one factor in economic development is that people ask if they're gonna grow their business here, if they're gonna bring their business here. What's your workforce like? Do you have a qualified, educated workforce? So I've dedicated 10 years of my life to 
uh, improving <coughs> our schools and educational opportunities. And now I want to make good things happen for the people across the city, not just in schools, but in opportunity in connecting families and people to workforce development and to the and to training opportunities. And if you have, if you invest in the people, the jobs will come. If you invest in the people, the jobs will come. I appreciate your support. I appreciate your incredible engagement for sitting through this long forum. And uh, as Blake mentioned, the election is in 28 days. Early voting starts a week from tomorrow. I welcome your support. If you have any questions after tonight, please call me. Please come by my campaign headquarters. I would love to earn your vote. Great candidates, thank you again. Uh, a few quick announcements. Uh, on Thursday at 6.30, the same organizations are sponsoring another forum, uh, but that time for our city council candidates. I'll of course, be here at the Knoxville News Sentinel here in the community room. Uh, we mentioned that uh, election day is 28 days away, but early voting begins uh, next Wednesday, and that will wrap up on Halloween. So nothing scarier than forgetting to vote, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again. People on the League of Women Voters table. Thank you very much for having yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. You're very Appreciate welcome. It. Thank you. Y'all are great sports for doing it. I'm sorry. You want us to pose for you? No. No pose. No pose. Oh, well, sure. sure. No pose. No no sure, I know. I know. You're not in your room. I'm sorry. I put a question kind of for both of you. Okay. Now, the city. Thank you. Great call. Thank you. 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 Thank you.